slept on us, man. We got the job done, man. Aggies oh, want to know, looking for the head. Y'all yeah. yeah. sleeping on HBCU football. Like, because yeah. yeah. we really yeah. doubt yeah. it. Yeah. HBCU yeah. football yeah. is really about yeah. that action. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the No Huddle here on HBCU Game Day. It's our first episode. I'm Tali Carr. Stephen J. Gaither and Wally Pitt will join us in just a few. But let's jump in with those Aggies who put some respect on HBCU football. They got the win over Jacksonville State. I wish the band would have been there. That fifth quarter would have been banging. Let's go to Montgomery, Alabama and beyond here on the No Huddle. If you look throughout the history, uh, when you play uh, ranked teams, I don't care whether it's a MEI school or a white school, uh, not many victories. That was the task for North Carolina A&T. Go on the road and knock off the number six team in the country, Jacksonville State. The Aggie defense, tough early on JSU quarterback Zarek Cooper. First quarter, Aggies on the scoreboard first. Maybe. Lamar Renard on the money to Ron Hunt, but take a closer look. That ball just squeezed out at the last minute. Reynard finds Zachary Leslie. Drip, drip, touchdown. Antoine Wilder, gotta love a linebacker that can cover. Ball, skills, INT. North Carolina INT tough on third down defense, but loose lips sink ships. A handful of unsportsmanlike penalties for too much talking. That turned stops into extended possessions. Let's go to the second quarter. Jacksonville State threatening in the red zone, but Aggies do. Right. They tighten up on the backstroke, and JSU settles for a field goal. 7-3 Aggies at the half. Third quarter, a little miscommunication on this Aggie route. Christian Wofford, he comes up with the pick. And Jacksonville State starts to roll. Cooper finds Daniel Bird. And Jacksonville State flies out to a 10-7 lead. But hold up. Hey. Ensuing kickoff. Malik Wilson. 98 yards. He does the running. His teammates do the blocking. That's textbook. That's a touchdown. The Aggies lead it 14-10. But Jacksonville State coming right back. And I was taking a hot dog break. See, what had happened was it was hot. I needed to replenish. But, well, anyway, Cooper finds Josh Pearson for a 40-yard touchdown, courtesy of the in-stadium crew here. Jacksonville State goes up 17-14. But again, no problem. Aggies drive right back down the field. Renard finds Elijah Bell, who was double-covered. That wasn't a problem either. Touchdown, Aggies. Go, Aggies. There was a problem with the extra point. A&T missed it. Now it's 2017 instead of 2117. That opens up options like maybe a tying field goal here in the fourth quarter. Just over two minutes to go. J-State threatening and fumbling. Amir McNeil puts his head in the game, literally. But the Aggies had to punt the ball right back. In 24 seconds remaining, Jacksonville State driving again. The crowd on their feet. Strip, sack, fumble, ball game. North Carolina A&T wins it 20-17 over the number six team in the country. A big statement for the Aggies. And HBCU football. But I think it was um, it was a big win for everybody, you know, not just for A and T. So we felt that um, we were playing for a whole lot of people, not just ourselves. North Carolina A and T's win over Jacksonville State was a big deal. Yeah, 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 we do this. We do this. We do this. Hey, I got respect. Y'all got respect. Ain't no more respect. The Aggies did it without their band, the Blue and Gold Marching Machine. The football team flew, and the Blue and Gold Marching Machine didn't make the seven-hour-plus drive from Greensboro. So instead, Jacksonville State had the halftime show all to itself.
And considering the last time we saw North Carolina A&T's band, they were tearing the roof off of Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It's no surprise that the A&T fans were disappointed to be bandless in Bama. The drive will be shorter this week when A&T heads to Greenville to play East Carolina, but the blue and gold marching machine won't be there either. ECU is hosting high school band week, so there won't be a performance that week for the Aggies either. Instead, A&T's band will make its debut September 8th in the team's first home game against Mars Hill. The band is an important part of HBCU football, but even without the bass drum, the beat goes on. But does that affect whether or not fans come to a game? Several of our Twitter followers said they made their decision to stay home on Saturday based on the Blue and Gold Marching Machine not being in the stands. That brings up the age-old question, how important is the marching band to HBCU football? This is HBCU Game Day, and I'm SJG. They won't ready! In January the 27th, the Blue and Gold Marching Machine! tell you one thing, a and we're very proud of our band. When our band comes, they show up and they show out. So um, while we could go online, you can tell the feeling in the stands is not quite the same as when the band is present. In fact, my daughter and I, we sit right next to the band at the home games. <laughs> the band wasn't able to make the trip. Uh. That, that's not our fault. Major disappointment. <laughs> We had to suffer through the horror of this, but Jiho is coming. Jiho is upon us, right? Meet us at Jiho. So we're good. We'll put it on the show. <laughs> what, what's the difference with the band's idea? It's just not the excitement, the entertainment, the liveliness. It's just not there. That's like the heart of our show. It's the heart of our game. So um, it's, it's, we're missing a big piece of the puzzle right now. The Aggie Pride piece is missing. Like, we're here. We're happy, but the band just brings it all home for us. So we miss you, band. We love you. So what an exciting victory. And joining the conversation now, Wally Pitt and Stephen J. Gaither. Guys, on the podcast last week, we talked about what would be the biggest storyline, that the band didn't show up or a and won. And honestly, we didn't know if a and was going to win or not, but they did. So obviously, that is now the biggest story. So Wally, Stephen, how big of a win, looking back on this a few days removed, was this over Jacksonville State? I think it was a, a really good win, obviously, for North Carolina A&T. You know, you play a nationally ranked uh, team in Jacksonville State. I think they're in the top six in some polls. And so for North Carolina A&T, that was definitely a, a big win uh, just to kind of validate, you know, some of the for the outside world at least. They proved that they could play a tough physical game against one of the schools from a tough physical conference. And uh, I think it gave them a lot of confidence next week uh, as they go into East Carolina. Wally, a lot of swag now for the Aggies. Would you say so? Oh, yeah. I think that's probably the biggest thing it did is kind of solidify their own um, their own confidence. You know, it's one thing to be in practice. It's one thing to go 12-0 and last year. But to come in, step up, you know, in a – I'd call it a weighted neutral site game and show up the way they did and play tough defense. I think it's validating to them. But um, I also think, you know, playing without the band and getting that win without the band was big too because the band is a, is a big part of pumping them up. So, I mean, I, I think you, you put the A&T band on there. It might have been 27-17, you know. I, I will say this, guys. I will say this. Jacksonville State was good. It was just different. It's just a totally different atmosphere. And, you know, I felt it through the first half. I was like, mm, man, a and band, if they were here. I I'll put it to you like this, and, and I'll this will be my final, final word on it. I didn't hear one rap song the entire game <laughs> at all. I did hear Sweet Home Alabama, but uh, no Drake. I, I think maybe some John Meyer was thrown in there. So not bad, not bad at all, just a very different atmosphere. I think that they are a good band in terms of, you know, the quality of their playing, but it's almost like they are more 4th of July parade and A&T's band is more live instruments at a cookout. So it's just different type of music that they're playing, but their band is actually quality. They had really good sound and they were in sync and they had real, like, they had real strong, like, uh, bass and rhythm under their, under their tone. So it was good. 
A&T wasn't the only game to go down to the wire. Prairie View and Rice decided in the final seconds. When we come back, Wally Pitt has the full recap here on the No Huddle. I think a lot of Florida State fans are excited about the type of offense uh, that you run. Talking about the Gulf Coast offense, I am. huh? Uh, Joey, you know about the Gulf Coast offense, huh? No. It originated at Florida A&M University. One thing they had to do was stop the pass, the air attack of the FAMU Rattlers. It consists of spreading the football horizontally, vertically, as much as possible, as quick as possible. Something's burning up in here. Son, you've been toast. It's just that easy. Golf Coast offense belongs to Florida a &M. They can call it the golf something, but I, I would prefer them not use Golf Coast offense being that we had a period in the 90s and early 2000s where it became nationally known for its passing yard and offense in general. And the Rattlers are off and going. They have made it look easy on one of the best defensive teams in Division I AA. Honor rolls out to his left, sets up, looks downfield. A strike. And then Lamb, six points, touchdown Florida and m They made it look easy. The one thing they had to do was stop the pass, the air attack of the FAMU Rattlers. open for six. And you've got to give credit where credit is due. That was a perfect pass. 25, 15, we got some more Week Zero action in HBCU football as Prairie View A&M and first-year head coach Eric Dooley headed into Rice Stadium looking to turn that joint into Astro World as they pulled into Houston in sicko mode looking to upset the Rice Owls, an FBS opponent from the Conference USA. The Panthers down 16-0 early when they decided the stargazing was over. Jalen Morton hits Zari and Holcomb for a dub and a touchdown. Prairie View down 16-7. Rice gets another field goal before Jalen Morton throws his second touchdown to Jose Medrano. Prairie View closes the gap 14-19. Then, the Panthers erase that gap completely as Jalen Morton gets his passing touchdown hat trick in one quarter with another 20-yard score, this one to Tristan Wallace, make it 21-19 Prairie View going into the half. On to the second half, the Panther running game came out like, who? What? As running back Bernard Goodwater makes the run game wake up with a 27-yard touchdown. Prairie View up 28-19, and the upset alert is officially on for real, for real status. Early in the fourth, though, Rice gets back on the carousel. Austin Walter gets an eight-yard score to make it a two-point game. And if you're a Prairie View A&M fan, this next play is rated NC-17. Side note, I hope y'all are keeping count of all these Travis Scott references I'm blessing you with as well. But this fourth down step goes over the punter's head. Darbone makes the safe play, pun intended, and the safety ties the game up at 28 apiece. Prairie View would get the ball back, but the Owls force a punt. Then Rice takes the ball down the field and the clock down to nothing, and it's RIP screw as Jack Fox hits the 23-yard field goal with no time left. Rice would get the actual win, 31-28, but Prairie View leaves with a moral victory as they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with an FBS opponent and nearly knocked them off on their own home field. So week zero is out of the books. We can move on now to week one. A lot of exciting games to look forward to. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but we do want to jump into a few, including Alabama State and Tuskegee. Now, the coaches got together on the campus of ASU last week to talk about the Labor Day Classic. Here's what they had to say. Alabama State and Tuskegee side by side. Willie Slater made the trip to enemy territory to meet with the media and talk about a game he's glad to have back on the schedule. I lived in a hometown of uh, Alabama State and Tuskegee fans, so I've been hearing it all my life. So I guess that's what makes it great. I mean, those fans, those fans just absolutely love those team teams playing. And this game may mean more than it ever has. The excitement could parlay, see what I did there, into a $1 million gate. Like, for real, for real. Last year, we were about at 600. I'm hoping that we can get the million dollar gate. So everyone get your tickets, help me hit my goal. So don't be last minute with this one. You could be left out. 
Uh, we have exceeded our uh, single game ticket sales for Tuskegee by about $50,000 from compared to last year. Last year we had a lot of walk-ups and we end up getting to capacity. Coach Ely would love to open up with a D2 tune-up game like some programs do, but he knows this is closer to the Super Bowl. Right out the blocks. Right out the blocks. We would love to be able to get a team in and fine-tune, but that's not the case, so we got to be prepared. And... Uh, and uh, to have a game with such, uh, as much weight as this game right off the bat, uh, you know, this game either uh, makes or breaks a lot of seasons if you don't handle it right. And despite the litany of activities surrounding this game, each team is focused on the one thing that matters the most. Saturday night, Montgomery between the lines. Those events are not for us. <laughs> Our job is to play. This is like having homecoming right out the block. So you got uh, six, seven days of events way before you get to the game. So you have to have a disciplined team that they don't partake in the events and now you, you know, they're too tired to perform on Saturdays. So that's what they're talking about when it comes to Alabama State and Tuskegee. We'll have much more on that here on HBCU Game Day because we're going to be doing the game live. And we thank you in advance for joining us. Stephen, Jake Aether, Wally Pitt rejoining the conversation. Steve, last year and, and more years than that, you've been to Virginia State and Norfolk State. There's not a lot of classic D2, D1 matchups still alive because the D1 boys don't want to play us. Uh, but that game is something special that they continue to do. What makes that game so great there in the Tidewater area? It's a rivalry that outplays division or conference. Last year, I was able to go up to Norfolk and see uh, – On the other side, uh, Coach Scott at Norfolk State, you know, all year they've heard, you guys let that D2 team beat you. So both teams will be looking to make statements in this game. Wally, Tennessee State Bethune-Cookman is on the week one schedule. I'll take that halftime any day of the week, but it should be a pretty good game as well. Yeah, I think it should be. Um, two teams that I think are going to be strong. It's definitely kind of like, uh, it's one of those matchups that, This might, be a, this might be a tough game, so um, I'm looking forward to it again. Yeah, both of those bands are going to be great, and I think this one has the chance to really be the like wild card, did you see that Tennessee State Bethune game? Uh, so I'm excited for it, and uh, man, another one I wish I could be at, because that one's going to be a knockdown drag out fight for sure. I'll tell you what, we talked a lot about A&T. They go to East Carolina. Look, I want them to win the game. Uh, I don't know that I put money on them shaking up the world two weeks in a row, but if they were to do that, guys, I mean, my head might explode if they beat East Carolina this weekend. I think that they're probably going to be pretty confident. My only uh, worry is that if they come into it a little too confident and then they get some of the air taken out of their sails, will they be able to come back and still – you know, still take ECU's best punch and keep rolling. But um, kind of like I said before the Jacksonville State game, I mean, run game, Markel's got to have 20-plus carries. Defense has to step up, make stops on third down, and Lamar's got to limit the turnovers. And if they do that, I think they got a chance. And, I mean, boy, uh, as a North Carolina Central Eagle, I am rooting for A&T heavy in this game. Uh, so, man, Aggies, if y'all win that – Y'all got me. Y'all got me for life. So, man, I can't wait for that. Hey, Sam Washington is the brand new coach at North Carolina A&T. There are several new coaches in the HBCU universe. Stephen J. Gaither gives us the rundown on that. Now. Over in the CIAA, Elizabeth City State brings in former Alabama A&M coach Anthony Jones. Lincoln, they're going with former NFL player Josh Dean. And Virginia Union is called in the doctor, Dr. Alvin Parker. Over in the MEAC, Rod Milstead is hoping to change Delaware State's fortunes. Morgan State, they're hoping for the same out of interim coach Ernest T. Jones. And an also interim, North Carolina Central's Granville Eastman. Former Prairie View coach Willie Simmons is the new head man down at Florida A&M. And speaking of the swag, Alabama A&M hires former Hampton Winston-Salem State coach Connell Maynard. Alabama State's gone with Donald Hill Ely. Cedric Thomas is calling the shots over at Arkansas Pine Bluff, while Vincent Dancy is taking over Mississippi Valley State. And Prairie View scooped up Eric Dooley from Grambling. 
And last but not least, Hampton picked up Robert Prunty, and Edward Waters has picked up Greg Ruffin. So those are the coaches. How about the players, and who might be this year's HBCU Game Day Protect Your Skull Player of the Year? There are lots of candidates. We can't get into all of them, but two of them that you have to talk about from day one, Amir Hall and Lamar Renard. You got the quarterback at Bowie. You got the quarterback at a and Amir's numbers, you see them on the screen. They are out of this world. But Lamar, ah, his team is probably going to get a little more shine as a Division I team. And then you got this big win uh, over Jacksonville State this weekend. Guys, would you rather be a D2 quarterback with astronomical numbers or a very good FCS quarterback whose team might get a little more shine? Who's in a better position here? Uh, exposure-wise, Amir or Lamar? Honestly, I think it's pretty even. For the mainstream media, you know, Lamar's probably going to have the edge there, definitely, and deservedly so for, I mean, he's 27-0 and 0 as a starter. Amir is definitely at the D2 level. He's a contender for the Harlan Hill Award. I think both guys are in a great position. Um, Lamar's already got a game under his belt. Uh, 12 for 20, 34 performance with the two touchdowns. So, uh, you know, we'll see how he plays against ECU. Um, but those games are definitely games he's going to be judged at, you know, going forward as well as what he does in the MEAC. Wally, Devontae Reynolds at North Carolina Central, he's another guy that people need to keep their eyes on. Yeah, that's that's the playmaker right there. Devontae Reynolds is, uh, man, I, I think it was that South Carolina State game uh, last year where he got that big, and that man intercepted a pitch and took it to the house. I mean, that dude is just a playmaker. Um, if he hadn't, you know, gotten into that little tussle at the Aggie Eagle Classic, that game might have turned out a little different since he had to sit there out um i'm excited i'm going to shoot with him this thursday to bring you guys a little uh a little segment on what he's up to and what he's looking forward to this year but yeah man that that dude all he does is make plays so um i'm excited to see him and the rest of that central defense this year steve down at grambling i wonder why christmas missed us <laughs> well he doesn't miss a lot of uh tackles and we're talking about Darius christmas the linebacker down there at Grambling, you know, for the last couple of years, they've really been known for their offense, you know, putting, uh, you know, Chad Williams in the league. Uh, yeah, Martez Carter and uh, and Devontae Kincaid, the quarterback. But they've had some great defenses on down there on the low. Uh, they stuck it to North Carolina A&T. They took, I think they got two picks uh, out of them last year, a couple turnovers last year, and that losing effort in the Celebration Bowl. So um, he's the heart and soul of that defense. Uh, he's a leader this year, um, and they're looking for big things out of him as they hope to continue uh, a streak uh, where they haven't lost a SWAT game in, in, in two years. So um, it's going to be really exciting for uh, the folks down at Grambling uh, as he tries to take on some of those high-powered offenses that we're used to seeing in the SWAT. Well, Christmas is going to be chasing P.J. Simmons down at Alcorn State. Uh, of course, we had the foot clam there last year, and then Simmons uh, is going to have a much bigger role. He's a very efficient runner. He'll Job in Washington, we wish him a lot of luck there as he chases those NFL dreams. But uh, Simmons, the preseason offensive player of the year in the SWAC. And uh, don't be surprised if he is the offensive player of the year once the season and the accolades are announced. Well, if we had an accolade to give to the best dancer, it goes to Sam Washington. He takes us out on our first episode of the No Huddle. Get it, coach. Get it. Get it. We'll see you guys next week.